Appendix cancer is uh, very different from its first cousin, which is colon and rectal cancer. Remember, the appendix is a, a very small diverticulum that uh, comes off the first part of the large bowel. But the disease uh, is extremely different than a colon cancer. And the, the reason is anatomic. The tumor in the appendix grows slowly over the course of time. The appendix makes a lot of mucus, and then you've got these cancer cells mixed with mucus, and what happens? You get a blowout. You get an appendicitis type situation, but it's not infection that causes the, the uh, uh, appendix to blow out. It's a tumor. And it used to be 30 years ago when you had this uh, rupture of a appendix with a mucinous tumor in it. It used to be the, the uh, survival was zero. Not zero, but double zero. Nobody survived what we call peritoneal metastases are spread throughout the abdomen and pelvis. Unknown, unknown to most people, we have made huge progress in the management of uh, uh, appendiceal malignancy. So as uh, in the past, zero patients survived. We're now looking at about 75% we're looking at a very large number of patients that with new surgical technology, we call it cytoreductive surgery, and then this chemotherapy washing of the abdomen and pelvis after the surgery, we call that HIPEC, or hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. My data would show that about 75% of patients can be cured of this disease. So there is a, a huge improvement in the, uh, the treatment of appendiceal cancer. And I would, I, would, I would contrast that to colon cancer, whereas the survival is now longer as a result of special treatments. In the end, the cure rate is just about the same. But we're talking now about people who are alive 20, 25, and 30 years after the treatment of peritoneal metastases from their mucinous appendiceal uh, malignancy. So the cause is different. It's a blowout of, of a naturally occurring a diverticulum, and its, its uh, treatments have changed uh, remarkably, uh, and the, the salvage is, is just incredibly different now than, than in the past. And why, why don't we get more press about it? Well, because only one in 100 colon cancers are in the, uh, the appendix. So we, we, don't, we, we haven't gotten, I think, the, the credit uh, that the uh, uh, appendiceal malignancy uh, patients uh, should, or the appendiceal malignancy physicians should get uh, in in their new treatments for this uh, disease. There are no special risk factors. No special risk factors, except that everybody is at risk. Just like everybody's at risk for appendicitis, why some people get these mucinous tumors and in the appendix and then and then you have this blowout with with uh, mucinous tumor being spread throughout the abdomen and pelvis uh, I, I I don't know um, the the uh, first part of the question about diagnosis is pretty straightforward for the most part over half the people, they just get a big abdomen. They get distended. It's often referred to as the jelly belly. And the jelly belly is just a buildup of this mucinous tumor within the abdomen and pelvis. Now, another 
rather substantial proportion of patients, about a quarter of the patients, they have an appendicitis. But unfortunately, it's not a routine appendicitis where you remove the infected organ and the patient gets better. It's an appendicitis, but it is accompanied by this leakage, by this leakage of, of mucinous uh, tumor into the uh, uh, peritoneal space. And so that's the uh, second uh, uh, um, important symptom. The third one is really very interesting, and that is a new onset hernia. Uh, many patients will develop a bulge at their, at their belly button, at their umbilicus, or a bulge in the inguinal region, often referred to as an inguinal hernia. And what this is, is this mucinous tumor making its way into this uh, small defect and expanding and and uh, the patient goes to their uh, physician saying gee i've got i've got this bulge and it, the, the 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 surgeon will say oh well it's a hernia and then he'll operate but then as soon as he begins to extract the sac sometimes liters liters of this mucinous fluid will uh, will come out and so those are the three major uh uh, symptoms that are associated with uh, appendiceal malignancy. The uh, treatment for appendix cancer, this is the mucinous epithelial malignancies, um, is uh, from its theoretical point of view, extremely straightforward. In actuality, it's quite complex. So the treatment is complete removal of all visible evidence of the disease from the entire abdomen and pelvis. That sounds simple, but it's not. Because the tumor has made its way into all of the peritoneal spaces. So in order to do this complete cytoreductive surgery, that's surgery to remove the tumor down to the cellular level, we have to strip the peritoneum from the undersurface of the right and left hemidiaphragm, from the pericolic uh, sulcus, the the areas on the side, we have to remove all of the peritoneum from the pelvis. So we have these five different peritoneectomy procedures. Peritoneectomy procedures were actually invented in order to treat the mucinous uh, appendiceal malignancies. Weren't really described before that. The tumor doesn't stick to parts of the uh, abdomen and pelvis that are in motion, like the small bowel. So the small bowel is, uh, for the most part, spared. We say it's relatively spared. But then there's portions of the small bowel that don't move, like the, the entrance of the stomach to the duodenum and the ileocecal valve region are where the small bowel uh, connects into the large bowel, are then way down uh, in the pelvis where the, the, the colon and the rectum come together. So very often you must combine these peritoneectomy procedures with rather extensive visceral or organ resections. Not enough. You do a big surgery, it's a big abdominal incision. Sometimes this surgery will take 12 hours. Okay, you have to have a, a fairly uh, strong surgeon and you have to have an even stronger patient to, uh, to uh, tolerate that. Following this complete removal, we lavage the peritoneal space, usually for 90 minutes. Now, there's a number of different high-pec treatment regimens. 
But uh, for the most part, they're a 90 minute lavage of the entire abdomen and pelvis, especially the bowel surfaces or what we call the visceral peritoneum. And uh, we, we would basically wash the abdominals uh, uh, and pelvic spaces with, with chemotherapy. It's a very dilute chemotherapy. Our, our, our goal is to get rid of any free cancer cells that have uh, been left, left behind. You know, it's uh, the old saying, it's what the surgeon doesn't see that kills the patient. Okay. So we're going to try and not leave any of these mucinous tumor cells behind. So we do the, the, the uh, uh, peritoneectomy procedures, and that's followed by the visceral resections. And then that's followed by a HIPEC or hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Then we put everything back together, and we hope uh, against hope that we don't have any, any complications and usually we do not. We have about a 1% mortality now with this big 12-hour uh, uh, surgical procedure and about a 10% serious complication rate. So we've learned a lot over the last 30 years. Uh, we, we can treat this disease very effectively. Well, of course, they want to know are they going to go through this big surgery and the chemotherapy and be in the hospital for uh, uh, 10 days uh, to uh, uh, three weeks? And is it going to profit them? And so it's extremely important that a very careful uh, preoperative workup take place. So you can look the patient in the eye and you can say, based on a review of the pathology. Is it a low grade, easy to remove or easier to remove, or is it a high grade and probably these visceral peritoneal surfaces going to be involved? So you've got to carefully review the, the histopathology and the patient should ask, and if they don't, I'll tell them you have a a low grade tumor or a moderate grade tumor or, you know, the appendix uh, 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 perforation can occur at any time. It can occur early in the course of the disease where you've got low grade cancer or the appendix perforation can occur later on. This is the uh, uh, per uh, perforations and mutations hypothesis. So you can have all different uh, grades or all different uh, uh, um, in, uh, invasive or, or, or non-invasive uh, cancer. So histopathology or what the pathologist sees on the slide is, is very important to us. Then CT scan. We have learned a tremendous amount about the, uh, the preoperative CT scan and which patients based on this uh, radiologic study are likely to have a complete cytoreduction and have this 75% chance of being alive and well at 20 years. 75% chance of being alive and well at, at 20 years versus maybe only 25% if it's a high grade disease. So I think that's the most important question that the patient needs to uh, ask is, what are my chances? What are my chances if, uh, and, and then we, 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 we also have to realize that in a disease like this, where a lot of experience and a lot of technical skill are required, Maybe the patient wants to ask their surgeon and their oncologist, what is your track record with this? How many have you done? And have you published your, uh, your results so that uh, you, know, you, you have undergone a peer review of your, your treatments? And... Um, not so many, not so many groups have had the discipline to do that. So if I were a patient, 
I would certainly want to ask my surgeon and uh, the oncologist who's uh, cooperating in, in these uh, uh, treatments, um, what's your track record? Pseudomyxoma peritonei, it's a complicated term, isn't it? It's, it's stuck around because uh, it, 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 it tells us a lot. It's pseudo, it's kind of a pseudo tumor. Is it, is it like other cancers? No, it's a pseudo tumor. Pseudo myxoma, it's myxomatous. It's, it's like the mucus that comes out of your nose, but unfortunately the mucus is contaminated by these low grade cancer cells. Pseudo myxoma peritonei, where is it? It's spread all over the spaces within the uh, abdomen and pelvis. So it basically is involving uh, uh, sometimes all of the peritoneal surfaces and we'd like it to be all those peritoneal surfaces, except the ones that are in motion, the small bowel, the stomach, the colon surfaces, which keep themselves relatively clean and allow us to do a, a huge surgical procedure, which uh, three months to six months afterwards, uh, the patient is uh, back to normal because we have not had to remove large uh, amounts of uh, what, what keeps us going on this earth. And, and that's the, uh, the gastrointestinal tract. Well, you, you have to talk about pseudomyxoma peritonei when you're talking about appendiceal malignancy. Remember, we, we said that the appendix is anatomically unique. It's different from all of the rest of the uh, large bowel. So, the tumor, as it mutates, and the, the, the molecular biologists, they tell us that it's over 80 mutations in order to go from a benign tumor to a invasive tumor that can go into the lymph nodes, into the liver, and then all over the body. So, um, what is pseudomyxoma? Well, pseudomyxoma is a blowout of an appendiceal tumor that's just getting started. I don't know how many mutations the pseudomyxoma will have, probably only a few uh, hostile mutations, whereas an appendiceal adenocarcinoma will have over 80 hostile mutations. So pseudomyxoma peritonei is a appendiceal tumor that has a, a blowout. The, the wall of the appendix has been breached by this appendiceal tumor, a very, very low grade, minimally invasive and usually not invasive at all tumor it's just gotten itself spread around the abdomen and pelvis because it grew and it burst and it, 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 it uh, uh, breached the wall of this very thin uh, diverticulum that we call the appendix. So pseudomyxoma peritonei uh, can, can have a huge volume of tumor and yet with peritoneectomy and visceral resections and HIPEC, we can cure about 85% of the patients with pseudomyxoma peritonei. Now there's one uh, a precautionary note. What really hurts us is patients who had a lot of surgery, but it was was not completely removed. And then the pseudomyxoma gets caught in all the little nooks and crannies and scar tissue and the like. So what's happened prior to a definitive cytoreduction will have an impact on the long-term outcome.
Well, the answer to both of the questions is no. Um, a prophylactic appendectomy just doesn't make sense with one exception. If you have an identical twin who has had uh, uh, an appendiceal malignancy, then you should have a prophylactic appendectomy uh, because the, the likelihood that you as an identical twin will have that same tumor is uh, extremely high. But the incidence, the incidence of appendiceal malignancy is so low that you would have to remove literally thousands of uh, normal uh, appendix uh, in order to uh, help one person uh, uh, escape an appendiceal malignancy. And then what about uh, trying to remove the appendix uh, colonoscopically? Well, I don't know. I've done a lot of colonoscopies in my day. I, I don't think I would like to try that maneuver. You can, of course, remove the appendix laparoscopically and very effectively. And a lot of surgeons will do a prophylactic appendectomy if they're in the abdomen for some other reason, especially if you're in the abdomen because there is ovarian cancer because a lot of the ovarian tumors that we see actually come from the perforated appendix and they settle out in the ovary. So it's, it's a good idea for the gynecologic oncologist always to remove the appendix when they go in to deal with an ovarian malignancy.